Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to say greetings to all you folks that will be listening to this later on, on a DVD that you'll be receiving in your homes, if you ask for it. We'll be glad to give it to you. My wife and I began attending our first feast back in 1970. As we came into the church, they had only recently started the church there in Bluefield, West Virginia. It hadn't been long uh, before we started attending. And through the years, we watched that church, the Worldwide Church of God, grow in numbers. At one time, I think, the statistics I heard was 150,000 people. And they were bringing in millions of dollars every year, tithes and offerings. And then, after Herbert W. Armstrong passed away, just as we watched it grow, we watched it fall apart. What a terrible time that was. I still remember the congregation I was in, attending services, and when you walked into the room, you would see a group of people on this side of the room, a group over here, a group over here, and they were talking. And it didn't take long before you could figure out that they were discussing which way they were going. And as a result of that, many splinter groups developed. I don't know how many there are now. Over 300 probably, maybe more. And they're spread all over the world. They call themselves the Church of God. And they remain faithful to the faith once delivered. In other words, what we were taught at the beginning. While many thousands, how many, I don't know, they drank the Kool-Aid that was poured out by Jody Koch and his minions. And they're not here with us today. Mr. Smith gave a sermon many, many years ago, I always remember, at the point of no return. You go so far away from God's truth and you can't come back. There's no hope because your mind changes. Your mindset changes. Your goals change. Your whole way of life changes once you drift back into that world. You ever ask yourself the question, why did some remain faithful? Some to this day. While the others apostatized and went right back into the world. You ever wonder about that? You ever wonder why you're here and they aren't? That's well, not for me to judge. Christ is a righteous judge, and he knows. But I do have an opinion about it. Now, I'll get to that in just a minute. In 2008, the U.S. of America elected a man by the name of Brack Hussein Obama. He ascended to the highest office in the land. I still remember his campaign slogans. He told us, I am going to fundamentally change America. Did he do it? We liked him so well, we gave him four more years to do it in. Now I say we, as America. Now he has partially fulfilled that promise. We have a divided nation where people are actually killing the men and women that try to protect them. They disregard the very flag that represents our freedom. And they're trying to destroy the very traditions that made us a great nation. They've destroyed the pride of our power. We've gone around the world apologizing for who we are and what we are and what we have bowing down before third-rate nations. And our military has been decimated. If you're not going to trust in God, you better trust in your military. We've made homosexuality legal. We don't know the difference between a man and a woman and a transvestite. And it's going to get worse. 
You're not going to know, know which bathroom to go into. We have a president that supported abortion. And he's brought thousands of illegal aliens into this country who have not assimilated into our culture. In the old days, when you migrated from Germany or France or Italy or wherever, you had to go through some tests. You had to learn to speak English, no matter how broken it is. You had to learn about our history, about our Constitution that no longer exists. Now we are afraid to wear T-shirts to school with the American flag on it for fear that there'll be rebellion. But we put other nations' flags on our shirts, and that's okay. And other nations can celebrate their religious holidays, but we can't. I'm not condoning Christmas, Easter, Halloween, but those are traditions of our country that are being taken away. They bring their culture with them. Now, on November the 8th, 2016, the American people will be going to the polls. In fact, they're already going, voting early. Going to be voting for another president. Two people are running. A woman, Hillary Clinton, and a man, a businessman named Donald Trump. If Hillary is elected, she will no doubt continue Obama's policies. And in four years, or eight maybe, that should be just about enough to ruin us. We will no longer become or be a republic or a democracy because it will be a one-party system, and that party system is liberal. And we showed the film several years ago about the agenda of the liberals and what they're going to do. They'll take over our schools. They will destroy our uh, religious system. They will introduce pagan ideas into our society. They will continue to tax us, and we will have lost the freedoms that we've had. The one nation on earth that the truth of God can be preached out to, and that will go away as well. So there will be a time when God's work will cease. Now, what if Trump's elected? Trump has come up with many ideas. I'm going to do this. I'm going to fix the bedrooms. I'm going to build a huge wall. It'll be a beautiful wall, a high wall. We're going to stop the drug traffic. We're going to go into the inner cities, and we're going to fix the problems. If he tries to do that, that will be rebellion. There'll be destruction in the streets. A nation divided cannot stand, and it's just a matter of time as well. Now, I've said that. Because I'm talking to a group of people that understand what's going on. Now, I mentioned that my wife and I came into church back in the 69, 70 area. And I remember sermons back in those days from some of the ministers that are no longer with us today. They said, if you want to stay in the church, here's what you have to do. We meticulously took notes. They said, you need to study. Study God's Word. You need to be educated. We've given sermons about learning the law because you're going to have to use that law to judge people. Study. You remember the Scripture about search the Scriptures as the Bereans do to prove all things that are true. First Thessalonians 5.21, prove those things and hold fast to that which is good. Those things are still embedded in my mind that I was told to do. I looked those scriptures up and I saw them in my Bible. Study. Study God's Word. Have it embedded in your mind. There will come a time when there's a famine of the Word. You won't be hearing what you're hearing today. And the DVDs that you receive and the tape that you have will no doubt be confiscated. So you better have it written right up here. Now, I wonder when I say about those people that left, what was in their minds? Had they studied? Had they proven it? I don't know. I do know that I was told and all these others have were told that if you want to stay in this church, if you leave, you're doomed to the lake of fire. We were afraid. 
to leave, to step out, to go to anywhere else. Actually, there weren't too many other places to go. But we were told that you couldn't leave. And so we stayed. And many of us stayed too long. I remember staying, and I was thankful that I was in a congregation where the minister was still preaching the truth. And I still remember the day that they sent someone from Pasadena, and they told him, either stop it or you're done. They were going to fire him. Thankfully, I was being transferred out of the area as well. We were told many things in those days. We were told that in the last days, Listen to what I'm saying, because this is important. In the last days, and you're living in them, the time's going to come, and I say what I said about the society we're living in, because the time's going to come when many of us could be deceived. It says if it were possible to deceive the very elect. Now, that's you. That's you and that's me. You're the elect of God. You're the, the, the saints of God. And deception is going to be so bad that you could be deceived. Now, is that what happened to those people? Because I still remember receiving that one booklet that stands out in my mind. and I still remember it now. Big letters, God is, dot, dot, dot. Remember it? And they said, we're not teaching the Trinity. We're teaching three hypostases. I said, for the first time in my life, I don't understand what I'm reading. It's not clear. It's not plain. I can't, I can't put it into the picture, the puzzle of God's plan. It doesn't fit. And they were teaching the Trinity. And they were lying to us. So I went back and I pulled out the Ten Commandments. I pulled out the correspondence courses. I pulled out my articles about God's law and the Holy Spirit, and I started reading them. And my, it began to come back into my mind. The confusion began to disappear. It began to clear up. They're wrong. You're right. you got to get out. You can't stay any longer. You're going to warp and pervert and pollute your mind. So I left. Since that time, I've left five other organizations. I'm not going to stay where it's not right. And at each time I left, the people that I had with me began to disperse. We have a smaller group now than we ever had. So be it. I've always said if I'm the only one standing, I've got to stand to what I know is right, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. Now, why am I telling you that? I said there are many splinter groups. I don't go on websites and look up what's going on in these other groups, and I don't denounce those other groups. I don't say that the Church of God New World Ministry is the only church. That would be a lie. And I would be no better than some of the people I listen to. There are God's people in every group, I think. And I can't evaluate them. Only God knows their minds and their hearts. But I know that there are wheat and there are tares in all those groups as well. And he said, let them grow up. And I'll sort it out at the end. He said, I'll send the angels. They'll pick, it, pick up the wheat and put them in my barn. And I'll let the tares be burned up. So I hear things from people from different groups. Like I said, I don't go look up what they're doing on the websites. I don't care how much they're growing. I don't know how big they are. I don't care how much money they're bringing in. It doesn't matter to me. And if they're preaching God's word, and I pray every night, God, if they're doing your will, bless them. But if they're not, then that'll be you to judge as well. Things you need to look out for in the future as we move on into another year. We were told a few basic scriptures that children are going to be our oppressors. Now, you evaluate what's going on in some of our cities, in some of our countries with the marches, with the killing every day of a police officer. And a lot of that is being led by young people. Young people who have been 
uh, influenced by the liberalism in our schools, not being taught anything of God's law, not being able to pray, not being able to say the Pledge of Allegiance, not even allowed to read the Bible in schools. What else can you expect? All they know is rebellion. They're not happy. They're not satisfied. Satan moves in. He divides and he conquers. And he, he's going to work through the young people to do that. So do you think that that prophecy is being fulfilled? Ask yourself. Look at your news. It also says women shall rule over us. Britain already has a woman ruling over them. If we elect that woman, I can't think of anything but the fulfillment of that prophecy. And I say we, I'm not voting. Whatever comes, it's God's will. I don't vote. I pray to God, God, your will be done, not mine. Not the people. He'll put in who he wants to. He puts in, and it says, the basis of men. It says we will become the tail, not the head. You know, the tail of a donkey or a horse or a, a, a cow, it wags back and forth, swatting flies. Well, that's where we are. People don't respect us as a nation. Oh, once we were a proud nation. Once we were respected by all, and God blessed us to the point that we helped all these countries around the world. If there was a hurricane, if there's a disaster, we'd send aid. We still try to do it, but we're heavily taxing the American people. I don't know how much longer they're going to be able to do that. We're no longer the head, we're the tail. We used to be the lender. Now we're the borrower. Over two, well, how many trillions of dollars in debt? Twenty? How can we sustain that? I can't even comprehend a billion dollars, much less trillions. You ever see that clock where it's clicking off how many billions of dollars are spending on a day? We've become the borrower. We've lost the pride of our power. The scriptures tell us, and you can see it happening right now in the Middle East. Now, I can't say whether Iran is the king of the south, but we do know that the king of the south is going to push at the king of the north. The king of the north is the European Union. It hasn't come together yet with the ten nations. But with Britain's exit and with economic conditions or military conditions or whatever it might be, then those nations are going to come together and you better be watching for it. Don't you listen to what your minister tells you. You look for it in the newspapers. You know the scriptures. You've been warned about what's going to take place. But you see it with your own eyes, these things I'm telling you, so that you'll know that prophecy is being fulfilled. It's marching on and it's marching on very quickly. So the king of the south is going to push, and it says they will push back like a blitzkrieg, and they will go into the Middle East. We know what's going to happen to the nation of we call Israel. It's going to go into captivity it, as well as us, as well as Britain, as well as the United States. You can't comprehend it, can you? I can't. I can go anywhere I want to. I can cross borders. Nobody stops me. Nobody searches my car. But that's not going to end. And I can't, I can't imagine it. But my Bible tells me it's going to happen. Once the government gains control and they get the weapons from the people, and they want it, they're using the old cliche, oh, we've got to take the weapons away from the killers. They want to take the weapons from everybody. So when they do what they want to do, nobody can stand up and fight. It says there's a call to arms if nobody shows up. Now, I don't know why. I don't know whether the military is going to be decimated. I don't know whether there will be any uh, weapons to fight with. Watch for that prophecy as well to be fulfilled. You also know that before they end, Christ said that Jerusalem, as Mr. Smith said, it's the city of Sodom and Gomorrah now, it's going to be encompassed by armies. So we know that when that happens, it won't be long. We also know that the man of sin, now who could that possibly be? That fellow dressed up in that long white robe with that pointed fish hat on his head who calls himself the vicar of Christ. I'm not afraid to say the Pope. I don't know which one it's going to be, but he will move down into the Middle East, go down into Jerusalem and set up his office. You can be watching for that as well. You watch for the, the Catholic Church and the European Union to merge together. The Catholic Church has always got the armies to do their bidding. 
Why would it change? Why would it change in the seventh resurrection, in the final resurrection of those nations? It won't. So, you say, Mr. Trent, why in the world on the last great day are you saying this? Why is this your message? Well, as I get through this, you're going to understand that God has a plan. Now, if you don't understand that plan, you better learn it. Because everything that is spoken and everything that is written has to fit into it. From the Passover, unleavened bread, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, the feast, and the last great day, it has to fit into that plan with Jesus Christ dying on the stake. So if somebody comes up with you or to you and preaches to you something contrary to that and it doesn't fit into the plan, you see the apostasies, God is, didn't fit into the plan. And something went off in my mind that told me, you're in the wrong place. And something better get in your mind, too. Don't be afraid. I'm not advocating that you leave anywhere that you're going. We have people here from different groups. We welcome you. We're glad you're here. But what I'm saying is some of the different groups out there, with some of the things that they're teaching, it ain't right. I should say isn't. I'm sorry, that's West Virginia slang. <laughs> I never knew isn't was a word but I knew I ain't was and I'd step on it when I get no I wouldn't but you see we've got to know and that's why I'm talking to you and to those members of God's church today because it's important that you discern God's given us a spirit of discernment you need to discern several years ago there's a fellow that attended church with us in one of the local groups that I used to visit on a monthly basis I was a little shocked when the man called me, but he called me. I didn't know him, but he said, Mr. Trent says, I've been out of God's church for a long time, and I just want to know something. Have I committed the unpardonable sin? I said, well, answer a question for me. Do you want to come back to church? Do you want to obey God? Oh, yes, more than anything else. I said, you haven't committed it. I said, the best thing for you to do is come on back, repent, of course, for what you've been doing out there, and come back to the church. Well, he came back. And we only met in this group once a month. So he wanted to attend church. He says, is it all right if I attend this other group? I don't tell people where to go. I don't try, I don't try to. It's not my business. If they want to go to this group, they want to go to that group, that, that's fine. So I said, it's up to you. So he went over there, and they started giving him sermonettes to do, and even sermons. So the minister of that other group found out when we were meeting. So it just so happened that's when he gave him a sermon, so he wouldn't come. Well, over a process of time, he completely stopped. And he was giving sermons, visiting all these other groups. He was one of the leading speakers over there. He called me one day. I need to ask you something, he said. He said, what does the church teach about resurrections? I said, it teaches three resurrections. If you count Christ, it's four. Well, I gave a sermon on that. And the president of the church called me and says, you're wrong. He says, we preach two. This is one of the Church of God congregations. A lot bigger than ours. I said, well... I can show you the scriptures that outline them. Somebody went through the thir three resurrections. What's you, Blaine? One of you did. The three resurrections, maybe uh, Ed, I don't know. But anyway, I proved it from the Bible. He said, well, I'll just put it on the shelf. He didn't want to leave. He wanted to keep speaking. He knew it was wrong. He never came back. But he's still with that group. Now, I don't know what else they're teaching over there. But it's allegedly one of the churches of God. Several years ago, Mr. Ed Porter joined us, and I remember on the reception night, the night before the, you know, we started services, and he said, I want to ask you a question. And uh, we sat down, we talked, we went off, I, I don't know, did we go in one of those side rooms, Ed, I don't know. But anyway, he asked me a question about Pentecost. He said, 
When is the resurrection? I said, the last trump. They say, that's why I say you got to know the plan. You got to know that there's seven seals. Each one of those seals are going to be peeled off. White horse, red horse, pale horse, black horse, tribulation, heavenly signs. Seventh seal comes up. What's the seventh seal? It consists of seven trumps. Seven trumpet plagues called the day of the Lord. And those seven trumpet plagues are going to pour it out, if you're reading your Bible, on those who keep and have the mark of the beast. Not God's people. The two and a half years of tribulation, the fifth seal, is going to be on God's people. But not the seventh seal. That seven plagues are going to pour it out upon those who have the mark of the beast. But the seventh trump, when it comes to that, there's seven more. And then when that final one sounds, that's the one you read about in 1 Corinthians 15. That's the last trump. First place, the only is four as well. When the last trump sounds, that's when Matthew 5 will be fulfilled. The hour is coming when all that are in the graves will hear his voice. Some will be resurrected to eternal life and some to eternal damnation. Now, the eternal damnation comes a thousand years later, but they can't give all of it to you at one time. So, So we went through that, and I explained to him. He, he had been with this organization. I'm not saying who they are. They was teaching that the resurrection for the saints was on Pentecost. You see, in the holy days, they do sound trumpets on all of them. In the old days, they did. So you have to understand the plan to know when that last trump sounds. And you know it's not going to be on Pentecost. Pentecost is the foundation of the New Testament church. And it represents the first fruits, which is you. And that's why I'm talking to you today about this. I don't know how many more feasts we're going to have, frankly. But I do hope there are others. I do hope we have the privilege of attending worship services as we have been in the past. But I don't know. So I'm going to pass the information on to those of you that are here. You're a small group. But it's important that you study. That's one thing that we learned. Fast occasionally. This is something we need to do more. Now I got a feeling when the food begins to disappear and the water begins to be polluted, and we become decimated as a nation, we're going to fast more. I hope you will. Because fasting is a means of drawing closer to God and showing Him your sincerity. In 2011, my wife was extremely ill and spent a week in a hospital packed in ice with temperatures elevated way up beyond normal and I sit outside the emergency room I see you and I watch the doctors on the phone talking back and forth and they looked at me and I was looking at them I wanted to know something and they avoided me every time they went they went out a different door so they wouldn't have to explain to me we don't know what's wrong well she had her gallbladder removed with pancreatitis that's one step close to pancreatic cancer but they removed it and we thought she was healing and they didn't know what to do, so they lifted her up to Knoxville. So I went home, and I walked through the house, and I looked around. I looked at her closet, and I looked at things that we had in common, things that, you know, we do every morning. We get up, she has coffee, I have tea, things like that. You begin to think about those things. And in my mind, I said, I don't know if I'll ever bring her out of a hospital. So they took her to Knoxville, and I got in my car, and it was about a 30, 40-minute drive. Well, in the meantime, before they moved her from Sevierville Hospital, I'd call Mr. John Shelton. I said, John, my wife's really, really bad. I said, I'm going to fast. <laughs> you have to know John. He said, I'll do it with you. So we began to fast. By the time I got to Knoxville, they had unhooked her from all the tubes. She recognized who I was, and it wasn't long before she was out, even though she had lost a tremendous amount of weight lost a lot of her hair, 
weak as she could be, could hardly walk up the steps to get home, but she began to improve. So fasting works. I just knew. I had a, a feeling that she was going to be healed. Fasting works. The third thing they told us to do, I'm talking about way back, folks, things that will keep you in God's church. Pray. They used to tell us, you better pray 30 minutes a day at least. Sometimes it's hard for me getting up to go to work to do that. But some way, somehow, we managed to do it. Sometimes longer than 30 minutes. And I guarantee you, when I was praying for my wife, it was longer than 30 minutes. And even day, today, I pray longer than 30 minutes. Don't ever stop praying. You're losing contact with your Creator. The one that heals you of your diseases. The one who keeps you safe during times of trouble. Who provides you with food and drink and protects your children. Don't ever stop losing that contact. Had those people in the world I'd lost that, I don't know. But something happened that they didn't see the picture enough to where they were willing to step out and to leave that organization. Eventually they would leave anyway. They didn't realize. You must stay with the spiritual organism, which is the church. Now, you, you can't be put out of God's church. You understand that? I can't put you out. Mr. Smith must say no minister can put you out. Now, they can put you out of their little organization. And like I said, I've been put out of five of them. It didn't bother me a bit. When I got the letter, I went, oh, thankfully for that. Now I can go on about what I need to do. It didn't bother me one bit because I know I'm in God's church and I know I have his spirit and I know that I have work to do yet. So we were supposed to do those things. Now, write it in your notes so that if you're not doing it, you get to doing it. If you want to be there at the last trump. It's imperative that you do that. You're supposed to live by every word of God. Matthew 4.4. 4. Is that indelibly stamped in your mind? Every word. It may not suit your lifestyle. It may not say what you want it to say. Homosexuals don't like God's word because it says it's abomination. There are other things God says. Be balanced in all that you do. Your marriages, every aspect of your life, we must put God's word into it. You live by that word and your lives will straighten out. You may have trials and tribulations, but you'll be at peace. That's the only way you can have it. His word is a lamp under our feet. It lights up a direction and the way we go. Now, one other point. You must attend the holy days and Sabbath services unless you have a legitimate reason not to be there. He says, don't neglect the assembling of yourselves together and so much more as the day approaches. The day's approaching. And I think it's getting close to being here. I don't think, and I can't remember, out of 46 years of attending the feast, I ever missed a, a day. Can't remember it. I missed a few Sabbaths along the way from sicknesses or for other particular reasons, but I can't ever, rem ever rem remember missing a Pentecost, unleavened bread, a Passover. I've had 46 of them. And I have to keep renewing that so that I'll keep the picture. The plan is still in my mind, lest I forget. So those are some points that you all can take home with you. If you're not doing it, I would advocate that you start doing it. I think that's one of the things that keeps you in God's church. Basics, isn't it? No new truth. I had a man tell me one time, man, I'm going to listen to this other guy. I've heard that stuff all my life. I said, thank God that we're still preaching that old stuff. He wanted something different. He wanted news. He wanted something that would uh, enlighten him or whatever it was. Now, having said that, let's go to Matthew, the sixth chapter. Matthew 6, I'm going to have to really, really hurry with my sermon. 
That's an introduction. That's what I got on my introduction. <laughs> All right, it says when you pray. It doesn't say if you pray. When you pray, pray in this manner. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Pray your kingdom come. Do you want it? Then you better be praying about it. Your kingdom is not of this world. Don't make it this world. Don't let anything in this world hold you back. Nothing. Family, money, prestige, pride, power, position, none of that. You want God's kingdom, and you want it with all your heart, mind, and soul. Now, he said, your will be done. That's the title of my sermon today, the will of God. We are to pray that God's will be done. What is God's will? Do you know it? We often wonder, why did God call me? Why did, did God open my mind when he didn't open anybody else's mind? I'm, I'm the only person in that coal camp of McDowell, West Virginia, that come to the knowledge of the truth. My wife's the only one in Upland, West Virginia. Many of you all are the only ones in your high schools that God called, or maybe in the state that you live in. Why did God call you? Because it fits into his will. Because he knows you. Remember the film we saw? He knows you before you're even formed. He knows those genes that are, you know, between the male and the female that come together. He knows what kind of person you're going to be. You're predestined. He has a, a group of people predestined that's going to be in his church. So we must know what God's will is. Christ said, I'm going to give you a few scriptures. I'm not going to look them up. You can look them up. And I encourage you to do that when you get a chance. John 4, 27 through 38. Christ said, I came to do the will of my Father. Well, he did. He came to build his church. He came to call out disciples to go into all the world. Is the church still here today? Well, he's still building it. So he came and he says, I, finally he said, I finished the work. I did what you called me to do. And his, the, his last dying breath was, Father, into your hands I commit myself. As he died. But his work's not over. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father now and working in all of us. Now, if you don't pray and if you don't have God's Spirit and you don't enrich it all the time, you're going to lose it. So you've got to have it so Christ can work in you. That's why you have to stay in constant. He's communicating to you through his word. You read it, and he answers your questions. And if you can't get an answer there, then you go to your ministry. And they, will, they should give you an answer there to help you with what your problems are. So Christ said, the will of my Father was to lose none that the Father has given me. So once he calls you, and once he opens your mind, he doesn't want to lose you. And he won't lose you unless you walk away, you see. Unless you stop praying, studying, fasting, keeping his holy days. If you want to walk away, just like the fellow walked away and didn't continue doing the things you should have been doing. There's a lot of watered-down stuff out there. You better be watching it. That's why you better look up these scriptures. You better know what that minister's t saying to you. You better look every single one of them up. Don't take our word for it. If one of our ministers say something wrong, call us in question. You ask us about it. We may make a mis mistake, a slip of the tongue or something, but it's not on purpose. And if you, if you call us into question about it, uh, that's your job. That's your responsibility. So, we turn to Matthew 13. I'm ignoring a lot of my notes. This is not the sermon I had intended to give you. I intended to go into a lot more detail about other things. But, I don't know. It just seemed like the thing I needed to do. So, in Matthew 13, verse 10, the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? You're educated people. If somebody asked you, why did God speak to people in parables, what would you tell them? You would tell them because he didn't want them to know, wouldn't you? He, but most people think that he spoke in parables to make it easy to understand. But you understand that he, he didn't want them to know. He blinded them. He blinded them because people who ignore the truth, they'll reach a point where God blinds them. Now, he may give you an opportunity and a lot of people come in knowledge to the truth. They've come in contact with the work of God. It's like I was telling you about lesson four in the correspondence course. Once you come to the Holy Spirit, they can't get past that. They take me off your list. They think it's a trinity, you see. So God has blinded a lot of people.
Let me tell you something else that you need to be watching for. I watched a telecast not long ago, and they concluded the telecast, and the minister, the leading minister, the president, said, now, this is the only place you're going to hear this. And I had just heard Mr. Taylor give a sermon on it the week before. Same subject, but in much more detail. And I said, that's a lie. Now, he that says, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth's not in him. If he lies to you about that, what else will he be lying to you about? Brother, we can't keep putting things on the shelf and ignoring it. <laughs> You've got to make decisions. You've got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling as time goes on. Now, if God blinds people and they can't understand the truth, what kind of God is that? Is he fair? That's what they said. Is God fair? There can't be anybody fairer than God. See, he gives, it's out there, the Bible's out there. How many people read the Bible? Well, it's a bestseller. You go to a motel, in most cases, you can still find a Bible, but it's not red. It's not dog-eared. There's no marks in it, like say my Bible. They don't read it. And many of them have got the Koran in it now. But they have access to it. And if they ignore it, it's like I heard years ago that one of the leading evangelists knew the truth about the Sabbath. He has a huge organization bringing millions of dollars today. But he said, if I teach the Sabbath, I won't have any people following me. So he went on. Back in Deuteronomy 1, 16 through 18, it says, you shall not be a respecter of persons in judgment. Do you think God would be a respecter of persons in judgment if he didn't offer salvation to all? 2 Peter 3, 9. Peter, as we heard about him, as being one of the apostles. One of the more rebellious ones to start with. Christ had to rebuke him on several occasions even promising that he would never deny him, but denied him actually three times on the night of his death. But later on, Peter became converted. He received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And Peter had an in-depth insight. Would you not, if you spent three and one-half years with your Creator, don't you think he told them things that aren't even written in the Bible? They knew things that we don't even know about. But we get bits and pieces of that information. But he did say this, in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness. There's some men you can't depend on. I mean, seriously. If you like your doctor, you can keep him. If you like your hospital plan, you can keep it. Some men will lie to you. And some women will as well. But God is very patient toward us. Remember, God's will is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So we see that God is a patient God, and God ultimately wants everyone to be in his kingdom. But, somebody came up here and spread all my notes out and got them all mixed up. But I'm back on track now. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. See, this is a marvelous thing about God's plan. I hope, you, I hope it excites you. I really do hope it excites you. And if you've lost the excitement, if you've lost the enthusiasm, then get it back. We're living in the most exciting period of time other than when Christ walked the earth of all the history of God's church. Oh, I'm sure the flood was something for Noah to, to be a part of, but he, he and his family are the only ones that saw that. And I'm sure that Daniel saw what was happening in the Babylonian regime and the apostles there were with Christ. It's very exciting times. 
But the end of the age has come upon us. And you can look back over all that history. And you see all those things that took place. With all of them. We're without excuse. We've got all the information. Or at least enough for salvation. It's all there. So we come to understand in 1 Corinthians 15. In verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead. And he's become the first fruits. Of those who have fallen asleep. Do you think all those men and women in Hebrews 11 didn't know that Christ was going to come to Jerusalem and set up? They looked for a city. They looked for that city, that bright and shining city on the hill. You know, when they first founded our country, that's what the, the people thought, that the United States of America was a bright and shining city on the hill for all the world to look at, and it was. What a nation we had with the blessings that God poured out upon us. But being carnal-minded people, we weren't satisfied with that. I don't know what we wanted. But he became the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, the dead, those that have died. For since by man came by death, men also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. But each in his own order. Now who was first? Christ. He's already there. He ascended after three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He's resurrected. It's been about up close to the day of Pentecost on the earth talking to people, seen by people. Then as the disciples looked at, up at him and they wondered, where's he going? And all they could see was the soles of his sandals as he went up and disappeared into the clouds, not to see him anymore. He was the first fruits. Afterwards, Who's next, folks? Read it in your Bible. Those that are his, at his coming. When's he coming? The seventh trump. Who's that going to be? Why am I spending so much time on this sermon today instead of telling you about the last great day? Because I want you all to be there. I want to tell you things that will get you there. I know it works. Because that's, why do you think I'm here? Why do you think my wife's here? Why do you think Arden and Grace and David and the Hickses, and Mr. Shadrick, and his family, and you go on and on, Phil. I can list all of you. You're here because you're applying these things that keep you here in God's church. You love the truth, and you want to be there at his coming. Because if you're not there at his coming, don't worry about the last great day. Don't worry about it. He won't even see it. So that's why it's imperative that you get there. And that's why it's imperative that I give this message today as we're giving it. But, John the 7th chapter, John 7, people say, well, Christ did away with the law. If he did away with the law, why did he keep it? It said he kept the law. Meticulously. He never broke one aspect of it. Not one aspect. He always kept it. He kept the Sabbath. He didn't keep it the way the Pharisees expected him to, but he kept it. He was Lord of the Sabbath. He made it for man. So he kept it, and he kept the holy days. And so did all the apostles. They're there written in the book, the New Testament of all those holy days. Verse 37, on the last day, that's what we're representing today, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink, as he who believes in me, as the Scripture has said. Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. What was he talking about? What is it that's necessary for salvation? God's Holy Spirit. How do you get it? What did Peter tell them? The men that had actually crucified him were pricked in their hearts. He said, Repent. Be baptized for the remission, forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 9 says, If you don't have the Spirit, you're none of His. So that's what you've got to have, the Spirit of God. That's what he was talking about. He said, The day's coming. I'm going to offer it to everybody. Well, on the last great day, God willing, you all have it. You're already going to be spirit beings. So he's offering to other people that haven't received it, that haven't been called, that have been blinded. Then he removed the scales from their eyes, just like he did Paul on the road to Damascus. Paul was blinded. He was stumbling around. 
And he heard this voice, Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? He knew who it was. He knew it was the Lord. He said, what do I do? He said, well, go over here and you wait until this man comes to see you. And he said, at that point in time, he said, I got some work for you to do. You go out here persecute my people and you're killing them. He says, I'll fix you. And I'll put you to work, doing my work. And he gave his life for it. So he removed it. It was just like he couldn't see it before, but all of a sudden the scales began to fall off his eyes. Remember what it says in the millennium? The, the blind shall see. Well, there may be some physical blindness, but there's going to be some spiritual blindness too. They're going to have their eyes opened up. All during the millennium, people are going to come to the knowledge of the truth. Only about a tenth, a tenth of the population is going to survive. Isaiah 6 tells you that. And then we begin to develop a new world during that thousand-year reign on earth. So we're going to have to reteach them. They're going to have to come to the knowledge of the truth of God as well. So he was speaking the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. He hadn't sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost as of yet, but it was coming to them. And on that day, how many received it? You know, sometimes I get a little frustrated. Our ministers talk. Are we doing any good? Are we reaching anybody? Are we helping anybody? We don't know. We go home. I, you know, sometimes I go home and Sabbath service and I'm thoroughly depressed. Did I say anything? Did I do anything that would help those people? And I don't know. We just don't know sometimes if we're reaching anyone. But the hour is coming and the time is coming that their eyes are going to be opened. I can't open anybody's eyes. Our ministry can't open anybody's eyes. God has to open their eyes so that they can see. Revelation 20. Revelation 20, verse 4. He's talking about you right here, brethren. They lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And we just got through living that out through the Feast of Tabernacles. The thousand year reign of Christ on earth, the millennium. You'll be living as spirit beings during that time, fulfilling God's will, teaching people. Whether you'll be ruling over ten cities, five cities, one city, maybe you'll be a mayor. I don't know what you'll be doing, but you'll be cleaning it up. That's you. But the rest of the dead, those that have been blinded through all these years, they didn't live again until a thousand years were finished. But then, at that time, there'll be a, another resurrection. It goes on and speaks of that. Let's go over to verse 11. John saw this. I don't know what he saw. I'd like to know how he visualized it. I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. This person that sat on that throne controlled the universe. He can make planets move out of the orbits. He could cause the mountains to collapse into the sea. He could cover the entire earth with water. And that's the one that was sitting on the throne who had the power to fulfill this. And there was found no place for them, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were opened. What books? Oh, you all have Bibles on your laps. That's what books were opened. Isn't that what God's judging you out of? Didn't we just say you have to keep the commandments if you enter into life? You have to pray. You have to study. All the things that we preach out of, that's the books that were open. They'll be judged the same way. And you'll be there teaching them as teachers, educating them. It says before they even make a mistake, you'll know it. No, 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 no. Put that cigarette out. Stop drinking too much. I don't know if you have that evil thought. I know what you're thinking. Of course, there won't be women in the world tomorrow wearing bikinis either that will tempt a man. There won't be any of that on the commercials. There'll be none of that garbage. There'll be a whole new system of language, whole new recreation programs, musical programs. Um, all of those things will be pure and clean, and uh, it'll be God's way. So the books were opened. And then another book was opened. What was that? Book of Life. And they'll be written right there along your names are, will already be there god willing and then he'll start writing other names he'll be writing your mothers your fathers your grandparents your ancestors people that have passed away people that you long to see my mother and father both 
my wife's mother and father, her sister, they'll all be there waiting, waiting on the resurrection. And when you begin to hear that, that sound of rattling, and you say, what is that rattle? And you'll, you'll look and, and you'll see coming out of the graveyards, these bones be coming up out of there and they'd be assembled together. Clack, 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 clack. And then all of a sudden, you'll stand and you'll witness it. And you'll, you'll see the bones of your ancestors and all of a sudden, tendons will be formed around it. The bones will be standing upright. Tendons, ligaments, and then the skin will become over the face. And those that died from cancer and all the other sicknesses and the diseases, they'll be healed. But they'll still be physical. He'll put breath into them and they'll start breathing. And they'll look around. Where am I? Am I in hell? That's what a lot of them died thinking as that Mack truck was coming at them and the last thing they saw and they breathed their last. No, they won't be in hell. They'll be in a potential for paradise. And then we'll go up and you'll say, Mom, Dad, let's go have a meal. Let's go talk. Let me tell you some things that I've learned. My dad studied this long before I did. He was never baptized. He'll be surprised, won't he? Boy, I didn't think you was going to amount to much. <laughs> but here you are. And we'll be able, it'll be one great family reunion. And we'll be able to teach them. They'll have approximately 100 years to be converted, to be changed. And then there'll be a, a miraculous ceremony when they too will be changed. And then it'll be one big happy family. All unified, all of the same mind, all living in peace, all living in prosperity. And it says there'll be no end to that government. But then, it ain't over, folks. Then all those that have rebelled against God, the earth will completely be encircled with fire and flames, and everything on this earth is going to be consumed in fire. And the earth is rotating out there on its axis, and we as spirit beings will survive it. But all the flesh and blood, as the rich man and Lazarus will see, will be consumed in fire. But then you look up, and here comes a new heaven and new earth encircling this globe. It'll be paradise. I don't have the words to explain it. Now let me ask you, is that worth waiting for? That's your inheritance. I think it is. So I just wanted to share that with you today to hopefully motivate, to inspire, to encourage you to study study your scriptures, to pray always, to fast. Don't neglect any of God's holy days and live by every word of God. And I feel relatively sure that we'll all be there at the last trump.